Welcome to the stage, founding editor of We the Women, Barka Dutt. Good morning, everyone. Come on, louder from the floor. Thank you. I flew 16 hours from a country called India to be here with all of you. And it is my absolute honor to introduce to you this morning some of the icons of the global feminist movement. Women who have not just preached from behind the pulpit, but have actually led movements for change. And it is movements like the ones we're going to talk about this morning that unite us. One of the intriguing things that I've discovered about the gender conversation is that it doesn't matter whether you're from Africa, Asia, Cameroon, India, Canada, New York, it doesn't matter because there's something universal about our conversations. One is no matter where we are, we're in battle. We're in battle mode the whole time. Sometimes we're battling silently, sometimes we're battling on the streets, but to get to that point on the street, to get that movement going, there's one thing that unites all movements, and that is breaking the silence. The women you will meet this morning have all broken the silence. The movements are disparate. Some of them are historical, the anti-apartheid movement, the movement for abortion rights in Ireland, the movement to organize women into trade unions. Some of them are the movements of today, the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement. Some of them are the movements of tomorrow. A young girl in Cameroon who talks about her grandmother using a hot stone iron on her breasts. Or I could tell you about children in India whose genitals are cut off at the age of seven. Female genital cutting is a reality. And we all have stories, some extreme, some not so extreme. And what we do with them is we bury them deep inside. And then what happens is it takes one person to break their own silence. And when they break their silence, in their articulation, we see our story. And so it's really mirror images and mirror images and mirror images. So what I want to do here with the time given to me today is actually break my own silence, tell you a little bit about myself, and then introduce the guests. My name is Bar Khadat. I'm a journalist. I'm a television journalist. I'm a columnist with the Washington Post. I've reported on war, conflict, politics, pretty much the big stories of South Asia. But it wasn't always like this for me. I grew up as the daughter of a journalist. My mother died when I was 13 years old. But when my mother wanted to be a journalist and she walked into a newspaper office to get a job, she was told that we do not hire women in our newsrooms. And if you want a job, all you'll get to do is to cover the flower shows in Delhi. She broke her silence, she fought that, and she went on to become India's first woman war correspondent. <laughs> 30 years later, I, when I was a journalist, and I wanted to go to the front line to be a war correspondent. I had my mother's role model in my, in my mind, and I went and asked the military for permission to go to the front line of a war that had erupted between India and Pakistan, and I was told, just like my mother had been in a different context 30 years ago, women cannot go to the front line. And I fought and fought and fought and fought and reached there. And that is what unifies movements, it's battle. But more than these external battles, the battles we really fight are the conversations we have with ourselves. I found that I was a strong, opinionated, aggressive, proud feminist. But it took me to get to my middle age to realize that I had buried things that had happened to me deep within. I had silenced parts of myself. And I decided that I could not heal and be whole and be really strong till I broke that silence. So I want to tell you here about something I've experienced and I'm hoping that you'll join me in taking a pledge today to never be silent and break your silence in your own ways. When I was a 10-year-old child, I was sexually abused by a relative. Like many children who are survivors of child sexual abuse, I took the blame onto myself. I thought I was dirty, I was grotesque, that I had done something to invite it. It took me years before I could tell anybody about it, and it took me decades before I could understand the damage it had done to me. When I was a college student, I was sexually abused, assaulted, and hit by a partner. At that time, 
I third-eyed myself and I said, this doesn't happen to strong women like me. You know what? It happens to all of us. I do not know a woman who has not had to fight some battle against harassment, against abuse, against predators. And so often, those predators, those perpetrators are within the circle of trust. I stand here today before thousands of people at Women Deliver to tell my story because movements cannot be driven by silence. Movements can only be formed and born and fueled if we decide to take a pledge to break our silence. And I cannot do that without telling you my own story. And I just want a show of hands on whether we're ready to break our silences, on whether you've experienced something that you've never been able to talk about. But I hope at the end of this conversation today, as we discuss the power of movements, you'll want to tell someone. It doesn't have to be from a stage. It can be telling one friend. It can be telling a relative. It can be confronting somebody who did this to you. But break the silence. So can we have a show of hands on wanting to break the silence, having had this happen to us, and taking a pledge today to break the silence and driving the movements for equality that bind us all together. Thank you. I'm going to call on stage women who are the silence breakers. And we're all going to be silence breakers by the end of this conversation. Can I please have our fantastic panel on stage, icons of the power of movements, movements that have actually brought real change to our lives. Can we please have our panel on? And then once they're on, I'll introduce them all very quickly, one by one. Please put your hands together for the real change makers, the women leading change and helping us to break our silence. So what I'm going to do is very quickly just introduce all of them. You'll have their names up on the stage, so we won't waste too much time. This is Alva. Alva led the movement to give women in Ireland the right to abortion. An amazing movement. <laughs> Zuleika Mandela, as you can guess by her last name. <laughs> she carries the Mandela legacy. She's an activist in her own right, fighting demons of her, of her own but also carrying her grandfather's legacy, born into the anti-apartheid <laughs> movement. Thank you. Next, Hargis Margaret has organized women into unions. Trade unions were the first movement. My friends, never forget that. Trade unions Ooh. were the first movement. Mm -hmm. And there is no freedom without economic independence and autonomy. Everything else comes later, so thank you. Tirana Bark. Here's, here's a question. How many of you have used the hashtag MeToo on the social media network? Don't, Anyone? Don't Anyone? <laughs> this is what movements do. They interconnect us. They unite us. Cultural contexts melt away. They melt away, and this is really what unites us. Vanina Escales, who's the founder of the Ni Una Minos movement, and a very, a very, very powerful movement that has given voice to women. <laughs> Tina Chen, you've heard of Time's Up? Yeah. <laughs> Their Time's Up now, but ours isn't, right? <laughs> Big round of applause for Tina. And Nolin Nabolivo, who's a political advisor for Diva for Equality. Welcome, Nolene. <laughs> and Chi Yvonne Lina saw her grandmother put a hot iron on her little cousin's breasts and decided she wouldn't let that happen to her. And what movements are are really about one person, as I was saying, breaking the silence. Yes? So as you see, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about historical movements, the movements of today, and the movements of tomorrow. And you'll find that you know, what unites them all is women deciding to tell our stories. And that is what I said in my opening remarks, that I really, really hope 
that all of us by the end of today are ready. You don't have to get on here. <laughs> Just tell, the, tell one person sitting next to you your story by the time you walk out of the hall today. I want to start with you, Alva. Ireland, abortion. <laughs> How did you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, we did it because young women and young men came together with incredible determination and focus and absolute passion to at long last gain the freedom for women that is so fundamental and basic to our lives. The right for any person who needs abortion to be able to have one. We built a huge coalition, we communicated, we talked, we planned, we strategized for years. We didn't we, d we did not occupy the ground of the opposition. We decided to take control and to define and determine how we were going to fight for abortion and to say we need abortion. Women need abortion. It is a fact of women's lives. It is an absolute reality. So we took that terrain for ourselves. We seized the initiative and decided to take control because for 35 years we had been reacting and saying, oh no, and oh yes, and doing whatever governments and the opposition actually said. And we said, no, we are going to build to seize this issue by the throat and to win it in five years. And we did it in four and a half. How did, you, how did you escape being judged? One of the reasons that women hesitate to speak, to break silence, is because they're just why they? We are sick of being judged. Well, absolutely. And it was so deeply, deeply silenced. I think it's something that we all share, this profound silencing of the experiences that are central mm -hmm. to our very beings as people, as human mm -hmm. beings, was being stifled. So it was incredibly important for us to be able to support and encourage women um, to, to tell to speak about their experiences, their testimonials to the distress, the pain, the suffering, the indignity, the humiliation that this denial of access to abortion had made really, you know, when I think about it, I think of the silence of women over generations going way back. Women stepped forward who said, 50 years ago, I had an abortion, and this is the first time I have ever spoken about it. Mm -hmm. Women spoke about it. It was deeply, deeply moving and deeply emotional. And I have to say that women stepping forward, it took such courage. You know, you, we, we all know about courage, but every time a woman stood up and said, I have had an abortion and I have not spoken about it in public, your heart just, just absolutely turned over. And I knew, we knew, that if our hearts were turning over, the hearts of the voters, the people, would turn over. That was where that sense of mm -hmm. the compassion and bringing people with us. So our central message was care. We care about women, and women need care, and specifically abortion care. And we need your compassion. So we didn't feel judged because we were saying to people, don't judge anyone. And yet here's the data, right? 23,000 women die every year from unsafe abortions. In my country, India, 10 women die every day from unsafe abortions. In Ireland, one young woman of Indian origin dies. She dies because she's not given an abortion. And suddenly, it's not the only catalyst, but it galvanizes women and men like never before. Well, yes, we had galvanized on many occasions before, but we had lost, and it was because we were on the wrong territory, so to speak. And this time, I have to say that the moment when Joachim Uzur said in a panel, one woman died in Ireland and it changed, Thousands and hundreds and thousands of women all over the world die, and it doesn't change. He was speaking specifically about Africa, and I found that a very humbling moment because that is so absolutely true. We don't only care about women in Ireland. We don't only care about women in Europe. We care about women absolutely everywhere, and it is incumbent on each and every single one of us to bring that care to the surface and to do whatever we can uh, about that. So, 
the first three movements, uh, as, as, as we've been saying, are of historical significance, abortion, the anti-apartheid movement, and the great trade union movement. Zuleika, uh, to be, to, to, to sort of grow up in the, in the shadow and the influence of the great man Mandela, yeah. uh, talk a little bit about how that formed you, that shaped you, yeah. that scared you, yeah. that intimidated you. It isn't that easy, is it? No, <laughs> um, not at all. You know, I've been, I've been saying all week um, at the conference that I'm the youth, I'm the youth, I'm the youth. I know I'm only, I'm turning 40 on my next birthday. Um, so I hope you guys know I was very young. I was very, very young in the early days. Um, you know, uh, when my grandfather was imprisoned um, and sentenced to life imprisonment in Robben Island. Um, you know, but I was, um, you know, deeply impacted um, by, you know, the F his efforts and those of my grandmothers. Um, and what I'm reminded of is, is really, you know, that the very difficult decisions that they had to make and the sacrifices that they had to make um, in order to ensure that, you know, in no way or in any capacity that they were ostracizing any group, you know, and there were so many lessons, um, you know, that they imparted. And one of them for me is to, you know, kind of like bring hope in the work that I do. And, you know, my grandparents and their legacy has really been the driving force behind um, the work that I do. Um, I established the Zolega Mandela Foundation uh, back in 2012. And that is really to, um, you know, bring hope um, to communities and people who are affected by uh, serious, um, you know, social ills that are faced by our communities. Um, me being a two-time uh, breast cancer survivor, me being a survivor of sexual violence, a survivor of physical violence, someone who, um, you know, is surviving depression, someone who is an addict, um, a drug addict, a sex addict, and someone who um, is a recovering alcoholic, you know, um, and, and my story is just one story. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think about, you know, the lessons that my grandparents have imparted and I think about, um, you know, what it is that they were trying to do and how it is that they were liberating not just South Africa, but, you know, the country as a whole. Um, to say that, you know, it shouldn't matter who you are, um, you know, where you come from or what the color of your skin is. Um, you know, we all need to be part and parcel of something that is going to bring about change. And, you know, when I think about the anti-apartheid, um, you know, um, movement, I think about how, you know, um, it had humanity, you know, lying in its core, and I think that's a very important thing. You know, um, I don't know how much time I have, but I just wanted to say something quickly, is that, you know, I was um, the, the, the baby that was smuggled into Robben Island by my grandmother. Oh. And, <laughs> and um, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, my, my grandmother, um, you know, God bless her soul, who actually begged a white prison guard, <laughs> um, begged a white prison guard to please allow my grandfather to, to, to hold me because he had never had any human contact. He wasn't allowed to have human contact with any of um, um, his grandchildren. Um, and, you know, here was a man who put himself in my grandfather's position and felt like he could no longer deny my grandfather, um, you know, that um, the opportunity to, to, to be human. Um, and so I think it's very important that we remember these lessons. I think in our own movements is that, you know, we need to, we need to learn the lessons lessons of the anti-apartheid um, um, movement, that there was so much power. We've been talking about power here, um, you know, at the conference, and there were so many powers that were, uh, for instance, um, harnessed by, you know, um, that movement. The ANC, you know, their campaign was uh, about more than just themselves. It was more than just about people's backgrounds. They wanted people to feel included and feel, um, you know, part of a, of a much bigger cause. And so, um, I don't know if that answers your question, because we can go on and on and on. Let, and let, me, let me just ask you this. When you decided to, to in a way, uh, talk to the world yeah. about your own personal battles, see, sometimes yes. what happens to women, especially women with, a, with, with carrying a famous family legacy, is that you tend to undermine your own battles, right? Yeah. I, I heard you say, that was only my story. Right. I, I just want to say, there is no story that's only your story. There is no story that's too small to be told. There is no story that is easy to tell. So I just, I just want to say that to you. Thank you. And, and, and we will talk more about okay. what that struggle was okay. like for you. Haldis, yes. trade unions came before Time's Up and Me Too and any notion we had of actually organizing and mobilizing women. This was, this was sort of the historic mobilization of women along with you know, women's right to vote. Talk a, talk a little bit about how much, has, how much has changed or maybe how little has changed. 
Well, I think that's not one story. There are very many stories. And I would like to start to say that, you know, it's very interesting to tell our own stories, but I think it's also very important that we listen and read mm -hmm. the stories to those who have gone before us. Yeah. And for me, that's part of the trade union movement. Because, as you said, it started in the 19th century, the modern trade union movement. But some parts of the world is still emerging. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing process. Yeah. But, you know, if one story is how the modern trade union movement evolved in my own country, which is Norway, and we often don't tell the stories where the women were involved, because there were actually women that started the modern trade union movement in Norway. They were factory workers in a match factory. They were exploited. They had hazard surroundings, health issues. It was terrible. But they had the ability and the strength to, or to mobilize, and to organize and to realize that it's through collective power that they will achieve their individual power. And that was the start of the modern trade union movement. Yes, yes, yes. And it continued in my union, I'm a teacher. My union was more or less established by strong women. And that was, uh, as you said, it was part of the suffragette movement. Yes. They were the same women that fought for the right to vote. The first president of the Female Teachers Union in Norway was also the first female member of parliament before they gained the right to vote in 1913. And they went on because they knew that they had to stand together as a collective movement. And I think that's the foundation that we bring forward as a trade union movement, that we can stand together, support each other, tell our stories together, and it's the collective strength of those stories that will bring us forward. Can I, can I ask you to talk briefly about this kind of superwoman strength that's required of, uh, of women who are uh, under pressure? And I will say that I find the superwoman uh, not a compliment, but a set of chains. Uh, I think it expects women to be everything. I think it expects women uh, to run the home, uh, to, to get the supper on the table, to rear the children, and go out and march on the street and organize into trade unions. And by the end of it, you feel like you're going crazy. Where does the empathy, the strength, where do, you, where do we get that from? Well, we have it, but I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> I think that part of what the trade union movement has done is to try to create circumstances mm -hmm. where you don't have to be that superwoman, that you, you, know, you can be like every man, that you can, <laughs> you can have a job, you can be at home, you can be active in society. So it's, you know, it's about, we have done collective bargaining to get uh, parental mm -hmm. leave rights, and you know, that's what unions have done. They, you know, they bargain, they get it into a collective agreement, and then they push for it to be universal for everyone. And that's the way that we stand together to gain rights. Fantastic. So if these were our historic movements, and we need to pay close attention to these, because from these movements, in some ways were born these movements, the movements of today, uh, the movements that we all recognize and relate to and talk about and have been powered uh, in a way extraordinarily, not through the system, but around the system. Because so many women have felt defeated by the legal system, by societal structures, and what you know, these fantastic movements did was to give a voice outside of those systems. Tirana, I want to start with you. Me Too is now a global, you know, it's the most globally recognizable shorthand along with Time's Up for women to understand what we're talking about. But, you know, I, I, I heard an interview of yours where you actually spoke about how personally traumatic it was for you to g get to the point where you could whisper Me Too to another person. And that's just what I was saying in my opening remarks, that the toughest thing is that first step stepping out of the silence. Mm. How did you, Tirana, step out of silence, your own, and help us all around the world break our silence? Well, my stepping out of silence was about a sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. I had made a commitment to my community and I had made a commitment to the young people in my community. And it became clear to me that they recognize that when you create safety or when you are attempting to create safety with, within a community, that it requires to, that there would be um, a bond and a trust, and they would immediately lean into that trust. Mm -hmm. and, and they did that by disclosing their experiences of sexual violence with me. And so I realized that I wasn't doing the work I needed to do to, 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 to meet them where they were, then I wasn't gonna be successful in helping them at all. And so I started, I realized that I had to figure out this work of unpacking my stuff. Yeah. 
And I have to say, like, t telling your story, we, we use that a lot, and I do encourage people to tell their stories, but there's also power in not telling your story. Explain there's, that. There's power in holding your story and, and recognizing. What I've watched over the last two years is the world trade on the labor of survivors, mm -hmm. right? They depend on us. They bring us to the forefront. They trot us out to tell these gory stories, mm. right? And nobody has takes into account what that does to us. That we, have to, that we have to live with the aftermath of having our stories displayed to the world and watch people actively not care. Yeah. And so I would say, tell your stories in places and ways that you want to, where you feel that they're productive, but also there's, when, when you experience sexual violence in particular, but any kind of violation, what's the worst part of that is losing the ability to make decisions about your body. Yeah. And so every decision you make after that is that much more important, including the decision not to speak. Mm -hmm. And so there's power in, in holding your story and using it when you want to and not being, for, I think there's this movement of like, the only pathway forward is to tell the world your story and I don't necessarily believe that. I don't. Yeah. I, don't. I think that if this world, if, if 15 million people standing up and saying me too in unison together does not tell the world that we have a pervasive problem with sexual violence, me giving you the gory details of what somebody did to me at six years old is not gonna change anything. Mm -hmm. So we should, be, we should be careful that people don't turn our stories into fodder for their you know, trauma porn. Um, but there is power. I think that the power in telling our stories is getting them out of our bodies and getting them into being in community with other people so that they don't feel alone. And me breaking my silence was more so about being in community with other survivors so that we knew that we existed for each other, that there was a show of empathy between us, that imp that exchange of empathy said, I see you. Mm -hmm. It was not necessarily, it was, it's political in the sense, small p, political, in the sense that there's power in numbers and that power grew from us realizing, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to live in a silo by myself and suffer alone. I can, I can be in community with other people who understand what this burden is, this thing is that I'm holding. And I think the reason why Me Too spread the way it did, because the words are simple, but the power behind them is not. Mm -hmm. but, but is silence not claustrophobic, lonely, it can isolating? Be. It can be, but I'm, I didn't say be silent. Tell, who, tell on your, your own terms. Yeah, I didn't say be silent. Be clear. I'm not telling anybody to be silent. I'm saying there are ways to tell, to talk about mm -hmm. your experience without having to tell your story, your sure. whole story. Mm -hmm. Nobody should be silent. There's no way that we can move forward in silence. But, but I hope people don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying hold your story and don't tell. You can, getting your story out is important. You can write it in a journal. You can paint it in a picture. You can tell it to a small group. You can talk to yourself in the mirror. It just doesn't have to always be this big mm -hmm. display. And I think it's a undue burden that we place, particularly on women, yes. to, to, cat, to, to bring our stories forward in order to, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I do. I think that when people understand the labor involved with carrying and sharing your story, you will realize that you are trading on the labor of survivors who have already, we've already done the thing, we've already survived the thing. And, and, and I so understand what you're saying because mm -hmm. those who have chosen to tell their stories in a public way, uh, it's not as if the world is out there empathetically waiting no. to, you know, no. say, hey, brave you. They're like, why were you silent for so long? This is the thing, people, people don't realize that what happens after. Most of us here, these are, you come to a conference like this because you're supportive, because you believe in women's rights, because you wanna help carry this forward. I would consider this a safer space, mm -hmm. right? To, to share something like that. What I'm saying is be careful be thoughtful and don't be intimidated into telling your story to move because it's to move the movement forward. People are lying when they say they have to hear the details of your story in order to understand what this thing is. They're lying. You do not have to hear the gory details to understand that. Yes. Uh, I just get Tina and then I'll come to you, Vanina. Okay. Tina, uh, because it's, it's a little bit interconnected and then I'll, I'll come to you. Uh, how do we one of the things that women are made to feel defensive about is your, you know, your outlaws. You're just ignoring the system. You're judging, you're labeling every man, you know, every man. Yeah. You're, you, it, it, there, there's this kind of counter uh, sort of factual backlash. Backlash. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that and how, how you handle that in the Time's Up 
movement. Yeah, well, first of all, can I say how, like, how amazing it is to be sitting here <laughs> with, with you and with all these amazing women. Fantastic and, you know, round of applause for so these amazing women. Incredible. It's great energy in this and room. And with this room, yeah. uh, because that's the strength that it comes from. So the uh, backlash is real and mm -hmm. it's happening, right? You know, so as we picked up the velocity from Me Too and the, the change that we want to make, which is what Time's Up is about, is to taking the stories, taking the power mm -hmm. of now we have named and seen the problem and yes. how big it is, thanks mm -hmm. to Tirana, um, is through Time's Up, what can we do to make change? Yeah. And that's why we created the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund to support low-income women and women who needed lawyers and defense to challenge the system. Um, and, but how do we manage the backlash? Is we have to say no, right? This is not, this is not, you know, saying that you're gonna solve this problem by never being in a room alone with a woman which is what some men are mm -hmm, saying, mm -hmm. right? You know, that is not mm -hmm. what we need to respond because what are we trying to do around p combating workplace sexual harassment? We're trying to create places where everyone, women of all kinds, can be safe, respected, mm -hmm. dignified, reach their full potential. Um, that's what we're trying to do. That's what pe men should want for their daughters. Mm -hmm. That's what they should want for their wives. Um, and this is, you know, and then we, we've got to like use every tool in the toolkit to achieve that. So, so how do we keep faith in the legal system when we watch the Kavanaugh hearing? No. <laughs> All right, so I kind of like want Alba to come to the United States because I feel like, all right, we need, you know, the Irish example to come back home right now on abortion rights. Well, yes, we are in a challenging time in my country mm. at the moment. Um, and yet, at the same time, you know, I, I think about when, what have we been able to do through the Times of Legal Defense Fund. You know, I think about a particular woman who bravely told her story to the Washington Post yes. after she got connected. You know, and there's a woman named Malin DeVoe. She was a hotel cook. Cook. Mm -hmm. And when she got sexually harassed, you know, in the workplace by a hotel engineer, did the thing that she should do, she spoke out, she went to her manager, and what happened? She got fired. Mm -hmm. She got fired. She was sitting at home. She's a single mom without a job the night of the Golden Globes, saw Oprah Winfrey's speech and felt like Oprah was talking directly to her. So she called us. We had just started the Times Up Legal Defense Fund. She called us. We put her together with a lawyer. They're working their way, her case now. The lawyer has filed a case for her. And what I always come back to about what our movement is about is Malin, her quote to the Washington Post was, I feel brave now. Uh -oh. I feel brave now because she had a lawyer. She had the movement of women behind her. She was not she alone. She wasn't struggling mm. alone. Yeah. She wasn't struggling alone. And that is, that's about trade union movements. That's what all these movements are is to create that collective power mm -hmm. and help and also reach back. You know, make sure that we are reaching back. When, one of the things I, I always give credit around Time's Up to the women of Hollywood, because yes, it started there with the Harvey Weinstein articles, but what those women knew was that they were women of privilege. Yes. They knew they were women of privilege. They knew that they had a platform. And they didn't just stand back and only care about themselves. They were very intentional from the beginning to use that privilege and platform to help low income open, to help restaurant workers mm -hmm. like Maylin and hotel workers and farm workers. And that's why we created the Defense Fund to make sure we could provide tangible, not just words, right? But tangible, real support for low income women who needed it. So that really Real intersectionality of women yeah. of privilege making sure they were inclusive and reaching out and creating an inclusive movement mm -hmm. is critical. It's critical. And breaking down barriers of class, of, of race, of religion, of caste. I think these are really yes. important conversations. Now, Vanina, one of the things that the movement you've steered has, 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 has actually addressed is that sense of isolation. That no story, no woman's story, no woman, no individual will be left behind. The, the Ni Una Minos movement. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Eh, bueno, yo voy a hablar en español, a diferencia de mis compañeras. Eh, eh, nosotras, en Ni Una Menos, lo que, lo que hicimos y lo que, lo que quisimos marcar era que los femicidios, los asesinatos de mujeres por cuestiones de género, eh, no eran hechos aislados, sino que podíamos ponerlos en una cadena y leerlos colectivamente. Eh, esa cadena de homicidios que llamamos femicidios y que están así reconocidas eh, en el derecho penal, eh, 
lo que tratamos de hacer fue mostrar con las herramientas que teníamos, muchas de nosotras somos periodistas, tenemos acceso a medios, tenemos acceso al, a redes sociales, tenemos, eh, recurrimos a todo nuestro, nuestro abanico de posibilidades para amplificar ese mensaje y para eh, sostener eh, y hacer comprensible que los femicidios se asientan en una cadena de violencias sociales eh, naturalizadas, eh, una cadena de violencias que dicen que las mujeres eh, no tenemos igualdad y que, y que debemos soportar ese tipo de, eh, de, de trato desigualitario. Entonces, lo que mostramos es que el femicidio es la punta del iceberg. Eh, debajo del femicidio hay todo un tejido de violencias, que son violencias económicas, sociales, culturales, uh -huh. eh, mediáticas, yeah. simbólicas. Eh, creo que ese mensaje fue, fue el que se hizo evidente y empezamos, eh, la sociedad argentina empezó a leer los femicidios en esa clave, no en el, no en el hecho particular, sino en todas las violencias que, previas a ese hecho. Eh, de esta forma, con todos los recursos que teníamos, eh, convocamos a personalidades de la televisión, actores y actrices, eh, gente de sindicatos, eh, deportistas, a, a llamar, a sumarse a la convocatoria del 3 de junio de 2015. Todos respondieron, todas respondieron. Y lo que pasó es que no hubo persona en la Argentina que no supiera que el 3 de junio de 2015 íbamos a salir a la calle a decir basta, a decir no nos sobran mujeres, no nos sobran lesbianas, no nos sobran travestis, no nos sobran jóvenes. Eh, y, y ese basta colectivo fue, eh, también conmovió las bases culturales. Eh, ni una menos tuvo impacto eh, en cómo se, se maneja nuestra vida cotidiana, en identificar micromachismos, en que dentro de los sindicatos, de las organizaciones sociales, de los colegios secundarios, se desarrollen protocolos para prevenir y actuar frente uh. a violencias por motivos de género. Entonces, creo que, que nuestro, nuestro cambio fue profundo a nivel cultural eh, y, y esperamos eh, que, bueno, que terminen. Al mismo tiempo, eh, los niveles de femicidio se sostienen. No es que han bajado, muere una mujer o una travesti cada 32 horas en la Argentina. Eh, y también bajó el presupuesto público. So, eh, pero creo que nuestro, nuestro cambio cultural... Hay una cosa muy importante del 3 de junio de 2015. Eh, por primera vez mucha gente salió a la calle y muchas eran niñas y niños y jóvenes y, adolesc y adolescentes. Eh, entonces creemos que, que el futuro es promisorio. ¿no? Thank you. Uh, it's it's uh, so important that you talk about structural violence. Uh, you know, and how that needs to change, uh, and the structures of violence, economic violence, media violence. And that brings us to the movements of tomorrow. Movements that are driven by younger people. Uh, even Alva was telling me earlier that in Ireland, one of the ways that this change was able to come is that young people uh, actually were at the forefront of pushing uh, this social change. But when we talk about media violence, one of the big tools of uh, you know, change uh, driven by young people is social media. But, but the online space can also be an extremely violent, misogynistic space uh, for women, uh, for anyone with a different opinion, for anyone questioning the dominant narrative. And Nalina, I just want to bring you in uh, on, on, you know, there's this assumption about young people, or young people don't care, or millennials don't care. Actually, young people are driving the change everywhere, and that's how it's getting bottom up. But it isn't easy to stand out and not be part of the herd. Yeah. So if you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. 
uh, first acknowledging the indigenous um, people of this land on which we meet. So thank you for that opportunity. Um, it's been a wonderful few days, I think. Um, as a woman who's working from a Pacific Island state from Fiji, one of the first things I think that, that is, is enabling people to be part of our movement, I really want people to get more familiar um, with this wonderful set of work around women defend, defending the commons. And the reason for that is it's unapologetically, joyfully, ridiculously feminist. And, <laughs> it, and if you set your principles really, really clearly um, at, at the start and the beginning and the, and the process of your work, then people find it really clear and easy to find their way into the movement. And I think that that's where the the kind of joy that we're seeing in, in both South and North organizing now is, is happening within the climate change movement. Because one of the things about this movement is it's about intergenerational equity. Mm -hmm. um, we're very, very deliberate about some of the language that we're using. And that's because we want to move it from this idea that all we're working on is a siloed approach to climate change. No, the same oppressors that are that are affecting our bodies every day, whether we're LGBTQI, whether we're women from the economic south, that includes those in the north, whether we're talking about unjust economic systems, um, no matter what it is that we're talking about, everyone has got to find their place within the movement. Young people are already demonstrating leadership, and the best way I think that, that we're seeing that happen is we've, we've got to to change everything, it takes everyone. We already have that, that, that language working within the climate change um, movements now. But the most important thing is that this is such an urgent moment. Um, what we're working on is, is an issue that's really unlike any other because now as humans, we have the potential to affect the entire biosphere. Young people know that. But we're starting to see an intergenerational shift so that all of us know that. And I think that's the most powerful part of the work that we're doing um, uh, in, in feminist organizing around climate change and ecological justice is we're saying it's about society, it's about economics, it's about ecological justice, and it's about climate. And it's about all those, it's, there's no kumbaya politics within the climate change movement now because we can't afford it. There's too much at risk. Thanks. Lena, I'm, I'm going to actually request you to tell a personal story here because so much of movements are about, as I said, you know, one of us confronting something we no longer want to be silent about and someone else seeing their story in our story. And, you know, uh, in your country, uh, and in many countries there are these traditions, so this is not about any one country versus the other, but your personal experience, you see your grandmother putting hot stone iron on your little cousin's breast. This is an entrenched social custom uh, because it's, it's a way of, in a sense, judging not just women's sexualities, but even adolescents. And it happens in different ways in different countries. In, in my part of the world, when a girl is bleeding, when she's having her period, she's often isolated, shunned, not allowed to touch the pickle bottle, not allowed to worship in the temple. So these, these things happen everywhere. The, the, the biological determinism that is sought to be inflicted on women. Can you please share your childhood memory and how you got up and decided to say enough? All right, story time. When I was 12 years old, I always loved to visit my grandmother, who I played with my cousin all the time. One fateful Friday afternoon, as I approached my grandmother's hut, the usual joyful chatters of my cousin was absent. As I went even closer, I heard someone groaning inside that hut. So I peeped through the keyhole and saw my grandmother warming a grinding stone on the fire the stone she normally uses to grind pepper. She was warming it on the hot flames of the fire and pressing on my cousin's chest. Her breasts were beginning to burn. So were mine. Very painful when your breasts are burning. Talk less of someone using a stone that is fire hot to press on your chest. My cousin was groaning continuously, and my grandmother, who was our number one protector, didn't stop. She kept doing it. A few minutes later, they would leave that kitchen and no one got to talk to me about what happened. And I got to find out for myself a few months later when she called into the same kitchen and asked me to pull off my shirt. Out of fear, I said, no, and the stone dropped. 
And that was when I found out about the power in my voice. Believe me or not, nobody ever spoke about breast ironing again. No mention in my community, no mention in the media. No, that's not a story of victory, it's a story of silence. The practice of breast ironing is a top secret between girls and mothers and grandmothers and aunties. Nobody talks about it. If you're not a victim, you don't know about it. And so I grew with that pain in my heart, wanting to break that silence. One day, more than 20 years after that day, I was Googling online stories about women, burning to tell that story, and I fell on a platform called World Pulse. I created a profile and I started sharing other stories, trying to muster courage. Like Tarana just said, it's not an ABC thing to just come online and start sharing stories, thinking that people are going to welcome you and encourage you. So there's that element of fear. But on Walpole, there was encouragement. People were saying, when I shared whatever thing I said, I, there was so much love. One day, I mustered the courage. And I wrote about breast ironing. Tremendous reaction from people from all over the world, even people from Cameroon. Wow, is this happening? Wow, thank you for sharing this story. And I got a call from CNN. Come to realize it, statistics from the United Nations says one in four girls in Cameroon is a victim of breast ironing, affecting three to four million girls. But no one is talking about it. When I broke the silence and got the reaction and encouragement from people from all over the world, I got even bolder. I started a campaign, a movement in Cameroon run by women leaders, going to churches, cultural women's groups, to markets, wherever women gather, to break the silence about breast ironing. And every time one woman shared her story, many other women shared their story. And before you know it, 35,000 women have disavowed breast ironing. And the movement's even continuing. <laughs> more and more women are getting the bold to talk about breast ironing in public and to say no. The BBC has covered breast ironing. National Geographic has covered breast ironing. The Independent has covered breast ironing. In the UK now, breast ironing has been on the cover. It's now being spoken about. It was not the case before. Right now in Cameroon, women are taking over the internet to share stories and share solutions, even about the violent crisis that is going on there. It was not the case before. I There's just want to ask you a power. question. Sorry to interrupt you. How old were you when you found the power to say no? I was 14. Oh my goodness. I, 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 don't, I think that power was born out of fear. And from that time, I knew that there's power in the voice. Say something if you want to change something. Yes. That's true. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Talking, talking about power, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm going to open this up now, and I want to ask you, Tarana, if I can start with you. When you're taking on really powerful people, mm -hmm. right? You've spoken about R.J. Kelly. Uh, Harvey Weinstein was a big deal in Hollywood. When women are taking on really powerful people, they could be individuals who represent power, they could be entrenched customs that represent the stranglehold of power. Can the change be led by an individual? You know, how does a movement, how, there's a, there's a gap between one person speaking, two people speaking, mm -hmm. and a movement that makes people feel they're not alone. In that gap, those who choose to start by breaking the silence, mm -hmm. what do they do? Because they're really powerful people, they can, you know, there is a sense of intimidation, of consequences, of backlash, of isolation. How did you deal with that? So I think one of the things I've, been, I've learned in the last couple of years in particular, because I, I grew up in movement work. I, I started organizing at 14, and so it's what I knew. And, and sometimes we live in bubbles when that happens, and you don't realize how people operate outside of that, is that I realize that people don't understand what movements are mm -hmm. and how they function. And particularly in this day and age when we have social media and a, a viral hashtag then instantly becomes yeah. a movement. Me Too is a movement that exists within the context of a larger movement that is eons old, right? right. It could be in any one of these little categories here because Me Too drops down in the middle of, and, and times up, in the middle of a decades and decades old movement to end violence against women, for gender equality and, 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 the, and the like. And so, Part of it is raising your voice and then finding the voices that are already out there. When you raise your voice enough, loud enough, and consistently enough, it resonates with other voices. And so it was, in, in, in my very particular instance, when I started this work, I was in the South. 
and I was in a community that was very powerful around other areas of social justice, but did not see sexual violence as a social justice issue. Mm -hmm. And so me talking about it was very scary because I had the people who raised me to be powerful, to use my voice, to fight back. Um, I was raised on resistance. And so when I realized that this was gonna take not just individual, like we had to deal with individual healing of, of the people who were affected, the young girls who were affected, but, uh, but we had to also specifically speak to the community issue that caused it. And when I started talking about the community issue, it was then all of, all of this pushback. And I said, well, what happened to the resistance? Mm -hmm. And then it took me finding, I guess, the wherewithal, and really the wherewithal came from the young people. Because the choice is, do I go backwards now? Do I go back to these young people and say, I'm sorry, we can't, we can't do this work anymore because nobody will support us? The misnomer, the misconception that so many people have is that one voice alone or a small group of voices is not enough. And that's not true. There were three of us, yeah. and three adults, and, se and several young people, and we kept doing the work. The very first action that we did in Selma, Alabama, in 2006, 2007, was getting a dean out of, the, out of the high school who was sexually harassing the girls in the high school. This was, this was 11 or 12 high school and middle school girls and three adults, or four adults, who came together to do this. Once we did that, other people said, oh, let me, mm -hmm. I wanna join in. So it's about consistency. It's about knowing that your small voice matters and it makes a difference and you have to keep using it until other people hear you. And they, people will hear you right away but if they hear you consistently, it helps build their courage. So for every time you raise your voice and you think it's falling on deaf ears, it is absolutely not. Somebody's hearing it and it, and it helps to build their courage until they say, hey, what are y'all doing over there? I, I think I wanna come and I wanna come to a meeting or I wanna join you and things like that. So that's why I tell people all the time, if you are in your own community, don't try to start a global movement or a national movement. Don't, you know, people ask me all the time, how do I start a movement? You can start a movement right where you are yes. by looking for the gaps that are all around you. Mm -hmm. And then thinking of finding other people who feel just like you do about those gaps, because it's never just one. And if, if it's just two people, you start there and you build. But you know, let me be the con let me be the <laughs> little bit of the contrarian here and say to you, Tina, what do you do when the most powerful man in your country is a misogynist? And I mean Donald <laughs> Trump. When is he not? <laughs> <laughs> But, but really, when it's well, institutionalized, you have a grab them by, by their pussies video for everyone to see, he still gets voted in, he talks crap every day on Twitter. How do you battle that? Well, you gotta, you, you gotta organize. You gotta organize. You cannot, I mean, we are at a critical juncture in my country, but I would submit not only in my country. No, right? There are yeah. critical elections happening in, there's one in this country coming up, there are in, in, in around the world, and you know, we cannot sit back and be complacent. Yeah. None of us can, none of us can, your family can't, your friends can't, your dorm mates can't. I mean, this, that's how, let's, let's be clear, I can speak to the United States. That's how they won. You know, what's the difference between Hillary Clinton as president and Donald J. Trump as president? 70,000 votes across three states. Mm -hmm. That's it. 70,000 people who decided they weren't going to show up that day on yeah. election day in my country. And the world is completely different. We cannot let that happen again next year. And so every single voice, so it's not just a voice on a movement, it's get yourself to the ballot box. Mm -hmm. Get yourself to the levers of power that are right in front of us in democracies mm -hmm. and use them because if we don't use them, guess what, the other side is using them. They are really good at it. You know, white Republicans show up to vote for dog catcher. You know, they will show up at every election, you know, to vote every time. And it's the same with what we see in these nationalistic parties showing up elsewhere. You know, that's what's happened to abortion rights in my country, yeah. Alva, is the right out-organized us for the last 30 uh, years. Yeah. They have out-organized <laughs> us. They are yeah. now poised to get rid of our Supreme Court protection. And you can see what's happening in Alabama and Missouri, you know, state by state by state. But we can combat it because in my home state of Illinois, we've spent the last three years flipping that legislature from totally anti-choice to now completely pro-choice, and we last week passed the most progressive, yeah. protective yeah. abortion rights legislation in the country. But it was organizing. 
It was individual organizing bit by bit. It was like trade union okay, organizing. Okay, I think organizing. everyone's going to jump in. I'll start with you, Tarana, and then I'll come to you. Uh, and, uh, just a, a small point about when you, the, the, the first question about what do you do when the leader of your country. I think that Donald Trump, we know he's a clown, right? He's a, he's a, <laughs> he is not somebody who we respect, people with, of good conscience respect as a leader, but also before Donald Trump existed, right? Yeah, yeah. We can't just get caught in the fact that all of a sudden yeah. now we're in this True. position. The leader of your church may be misogynistic. Yeah. The leader of your, your, your community may be a misogynist. And it's really about not one person, but attacking the system as a True. whole. We True. have to not, I mean, we have to get Donald Trump out of office. It's our top priority in the United States. <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want to be unclear about that. But I also, it's a fair point. I also don't want to just leave it at the feet of Donald Trump because Do Donald Trump comes out of office and your, your local yes. senator, your mayor, yes. your, the, the head of the CEO of your company, whatever, we have to attack the system of, uh, the, the oppressive system of misogyny and patriarchy. Uh, Haldis, yes. <laughs> No, I was thinking when Toronto was speaking here, you know, and you were asking about a movement and how do you take on the people of power mm -hmm. and uh, not everyone who wants to voice has uh, the courage to do that right. or really know what the consequences are. Yeah. And that's when I think it's important that we are there for each other. Mm -hmm. And I believe that it, uh, the old <laughs> trade union movement can play an important role there. Not taking over new movements, but working alongside and behind and supporting. Mm -hmm. When the Me Too movement exploded, we did try to do something. I represent 32 million predominantly women around the world, and I know other global unions did the same thing. And it's about how can we support, because I'm sure there are women among uh, our members who use the hashtag, how can we support them the minute they come home, the minute they are com confronted, the minute someone tries to push them down? And we have a strong system. We can give them legal advice. We can be there for them as a collective. We can give advice. So it's about using each other. Mm. And also the education system. I won't talk about that now. But we can also <laughs> do some of the boring stuff. Next yes. week, the International Labour Conference starts in Geneva. Yes. And you know we're pushing as unions as another for a convention against violence in the workplace. Yes. And can you believe it that in 2019 there are governments that don't want to sign on to this, oh, not yeah. support it, there are employers that don't want to support them, and if there are any in this room, you better rethink it. Because how can you not yeah. want to prevent violence in the workplace? And I think you make a really uh, important point that you know movements sometimes build up slowly. And I will say to you, Tarana, that uh, Me Too didn't catch on immediately in India, but it came about a year and a half later, yeah. and actually 20 women journalists, uh, I'm a journalist, spoke up, and we actually got a minister to quit office. So uh, thank you. Uh, movements do travel globally. Yeah. Uh, I just want to ask you a slightly complex question, Alva. And the question is this, we know that Men can be feminists and women can be feminists. We also know that women are socialized by patriarchy and women can be misogynistic as well. Mm -hmm. So when you are handling something as sensitive as abortion in your country, and there are women who say to you, we don't want this, what do you do? Well, I, I think first of all, you know, Ireland is a democracy. I, we respect the right of people to hold different views, but we also have the right and the obligation and the duty to say when those views are hostile to and damaging to women and to other people that we absolutely must challenge them. Um, but it's not, I always think in a social movement, it's, you know, I agree very much with, with Tarana, you're not out there, it, it's, it's about bringing people with you, it's about b bringing people with you through action, not just words. It's mm -hmm. actually also getting out there on the streets and showing you know, your power uh, in that way. You're bringing people with you. What you're doing is you're encouraging, supporting, persuading. You're not lecturing, hectoring, bullying, and intimidating. And I mean, I think that was something that was very important in our campaign, that we didn't set out there to convince people whose minds, women and men, whose minds were dead set against abortion. That's the way they were. We, we couldn't ship right. that, but what we could actually address were people, decent people, with a sense of humanity, with a sense of real care about what happens to people in their lives, women and anyone who needs an abortion. And we could actually say that's what we stand for. So it was never about picking and, and attacking. But just one thing I do want to say, you know, 
I'm incredibly thrilled, picking up on what Tina was saying, I'm incredibly thrilled to be here. I can't believe it. I'm still kind of pinching myself that it's happening. And this brilliant power in here. Think of what we could do if we all got up out there into the world this minute. But, <laughs> but, but I have to tell you, there is a little part of me that is that longs to be in Ireland because the anti-Trump protests against his visit in Ireland are taking place <laughs> now. <laughs> and, and they are, the protest is a huge coalition of feminist, anti-racist, yes, LGBTIQ, yes. trades unions, political parties, oh, wow, everybody yeah. is out there. Hashtag no to Trump, Trump not welcome. <laughs> <laughs> And that matters, that matters in the world. No, it's not just about Trump. It is the whole system yes. yeah. that he symbolizes, right. that he structures, that he gives words yes. to, yes. that he gives leadership to, that we have to be against. But at the same time, we have to say we are bigger. We have yes. more belief. We That's occupy right. more space. Yes. We just have to hold hands and do it together. Yes. 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 Uh, Tina and then Noli. Tina, up on Tina. What Alba just said though about the holding hands and come together because, all right, so let's be plain here. One of the things that we have done to ourselves over the last, I've been in the women's movement my entire adult life and I'm 63, right? So it's been a long time, is we have divided ourselves, right? You know, the women's movement is incredibly fractured. Right? We have women's health over here, economic empowerment over here, we have sexual violence over here, you know, we have you know, education over here. And you know, we often, I found this when I was in the White House, you know, working on the White House Council of Women and Girls, all the groups would come to us but they wouldn't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. The international mm -hmm. women's health groups weren't talking to the U.S. domestic women's health groups. It's sort of why we created the United State of Women to mm -hmm. do that. It's why I love what we have here. What's the energy we've been feeling the last four days? It is that we're not in our little silos, right? right? We see the intersectionality and how similar our issues are, how the enemies are the same, mm -hmm. how we need to work together. And then we have a tendency, so let's be real here, we have a tendency to go back home, <laughs> go back to our own organization, yeah. go back to our silo. And we have really, as a women's movement, got to overcome that. Yes. We have really got to change that dynamic and see ourselves connected in a could, very could, real and could, lasting could you, way. Could you briefly speak to how you and Tirana, for example, Time's Up and Me Too are, are rooted in similar contexts and often what happens with movements is they operate in silos. Did, were you able to find convergences? Oh, yes. <laughs> no, but yes, yes. But everybody I here mean, doesn't know about that. Well, so talk part about of it that. is to respect the fact, I talk, every time I talk about Time's Up, I talk about Me Too and I acknowledge the fact that Me Too wasn't like a new thing in 2017. Mm -hmm. It was something Tarana had started many years prior out of her own courage. And I think part of that is to respect, you know, we're not like the geniuses of designing our own stuff all the time. We are mm -hmm. on the, you know, we have learned from others. That's we right. have to acknowledge that we followed a path trod and the brush cut down by other women ahead of us and not be so impressed with our own success, quite <laughs> frankly, right? <laughs> right? And, and sort of recognize and respect that. And, you know, Toronto, when I, Toronto is the place that gives the voice and the fuel to the work that then Time's Up can come behind, quite frankly, on, to then, all right, how do we make the sustainable change inside companies, you know, inside state legislatures, mm -hmm. and do that. And the two things have to go together, but we have to respect and acknowledge each other. Yeah. And more of us need to start doing that. Nolene. You know, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is, I work in a context in the Pacific where we have epidemic proportions of violence against women. 60 to 80% of women have experienced um, sexual violence. Um, and we've just finished a four-year report that shows that 84% 80, of LGBTQI people um, experience violence, um, sexual violence during their lifetime. And so when you work in that kind of context and where we still have governments, for instance, in Papua New Guinea where there's not one woman in the national legislature, then what we have to really internalize is that context really, really matters. Yeah. And it doesn't matter, you know, at a, at a kind of 
surface level in the air. It matters in the way we move. It matters in the way that every day we have to wake up and scrub the patriarchy off us. And we scrub it off our bodies, but we also scrub it off our schools, yeah. our children who have to live in this. I, I now have a 13 month, uh, you know, I'm starting late on this motherhood stuff, <laughs> learning every day. Um, but you know, every, every hour of every day, if we're building movements, we have to be, we have to internalize what is transformative and different about our possibilities. Because, I, so, so for me, when you're saying, you know, what helps a movement to grow and to, to sustain itself is a resistance culture, a liberation culture, and to explicitly own that. Because, you know, when you're waking up every day, sometimes it's hard to just get out of that shower and into the world when you know that someone is going to look at you as a lesbian as you walk out of your room mm -hmm. and as you do your work, refusing to let your body only be about one kind of identity, that where many, many, ex you know, intersectionality, this, this beautiful, incredible set of con concepts that we have from the African-American movement, but that now has been used by many of us, you know, on, on race, on ethnicity and class and color, we have to own everything that we've been doing as movements from the background because it's not only about those up on this stage, it's the absolutely countless number of us who are doing this work every day, waking up every day, being like Zen, going around the rock. Whenever there's <laughs> things that we can't move, we find another way. So for me, that's the thing, is just keeping, keeping on going and keeping the, the balance between the reality of where we are right now and the joy, the possibilities mm -hmm. of what, oh, what yeah. we can do. So yeah. I, I want to... I want to bring Venina in, but I just, I, I just want to ask Lena the same question that I asked Alva, because Lena, you said no to grandmothers who were putting these hot stone irons mm -hmm. on, on the breasts of little, little girls. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I always say that women, you know, w women who are perpetrators of misogyny are also victims uh, of patriarchy. And I'm just wondering whether you've made an attempt to talk to those grandmothers. How have they responded to these calls for change? Your Fabulous. own grandmother, for example. Those who are from Cameroon here would know about the Takumbung. Powerful set of grandmothers. When they come out on the streets, even the soldiers take off. Mm -hmm. Because it is a taboo to see their nakedness. And they threaten soldiers with their nakedness. And they are the custodians of tradition. So when I started my campaign, that's who I went to. When I succeeded to convince the Takumbung that breast ironing is a no-no, every other person had to shut up because those are the custodians of tradition. And I strongly believe that to change the, the, the setup, to, to shake the foundation of gender-based violence, we need to go to the custodians of tradition and have some dialogue and reasoning because we are living in a time when everybody knows and likes what is good. Like Kaja always says, what is it not to like about women thriving? What is it not to like mm -hmm. about healthy breast for the women who want to stay back at home and have babies. Let's go to that base if you want to think that women, women can only have babies. So it's about speaking to custodians of tradition. And it's about sometimes there's resistance. But guess what? How do we overcome that resistance is to make women feed off of each other's energy through connecting online. When I saw Natasha here on Monday, I was asking myself, what if a girl in Jam Jam in Balinyonga or Kikaikelaki somewhere in Africa sees Natasha in Canada on this platform speaking in front of head of state? They will feed off each other's energy. There's going to be inspiration and they're going to start questioning the norms around them. So in my opinion, when we succeed to make women to believe that the, the strength in their personal decision and strength in them standing up for themselves, even patriarchy is forced to bow. Because change only comes through strong resistance. That's my strong belief. Venina. decir, agregar algo a lo que a lo que estaba escuchando. Nosotras, eh, primero, a mí también me gustaría estar en la Argentina porque hoy está Bolsonaro en la Argentina y hay una gran manifestación eh, en contra eh, el presidente de Brasil. Eh, nosotras en la Argentina, desde desde la recuperación de la democracia, tenemos un movimiento de derechos humanos eh, muy fuerte y, y las mujeres eh, organizan desde 1986 en adelante cada año encuentros nacionales de mujeres. Este año va a ser el número 34. Eh, es una experiencia inédita 
Todas las mujeres, o muchas mujeres de distintos puntos de la Argentina viajan a reunirse, a estar juntas, a intercambiar experiencias, eh, a, a pensar estrategias y acciones en común. De, de uno de esos encuentros nacionales de mujeres surgió la idea de hacer una campaña nacional por el derecho al aborto legal, seguro y gratuito. Eh, por otra parte, eh, nosotras desde 2015, desde, desde Ni Una Menos, lo que pasó es que impactó en los encuentros nacionales de mujeres y la concurrencia se duplicó. Eh, cada vez más mujeres y jóvenes, sobre todo eh, adolescentes, van a los encuentros eh, de mujeres y desde Ni Una Menos comenzamos a hacer, por esto que decías, de que a veces estamos separadas. Eh, comenzamos a hacer asambleas y, y a tratar de que toda la diversidad de los feminismos pudiéramos confluir en espacios en común y tener eh, al menos objetivos, si no todos, algunos objetivos en común y trabajar por ello. So, I mean, the word may be a cliche, intersectionality, but we've got to say it over and over and over and over again that we cannot have exclusion in any of these movements. It cannot look like it's open to some and not to all. So thank you for that, Venina. Mm -hmm. uh, Zuleika, I want to bring you in. You, you know, you opened with sharing a little bit about your own battles. And I think the thing with women is that we're so busy being strong that we sometimes judge ourselves for just being flawed human beings, which we all are, all each one of us. What made you actually tell the world about all your battles, uh, not just surviving cancer, but your battle with addiction, which you mentioned briefly? What made you do that? Because did you, you, know, you already had the microscope on you. You, were, you had a famous yeah. last name. You were Mandela's granddaughter. Yeah. And then here you are. You're like, I'm not, I'm not just going to tell the good part about myself. I'm right. going to tell you everything about right. me. Right. Um, because there's still that misconception that being a Mandela makes you immune to real struggles, you know, uh, the things that, you know, so many women and our children go through uh, every day. Um, I guess um, for me, you know, um, I, I had been, um, you know, sexually and physically abused for such a long time and um, my issue was I didn't know that I could ask for help. Um, and, and so I, I do believe that there is indeed such a, um, a power to, um, you know, telling your story, um, you know, and so with the, with the work that I'm doing, it's, it's just really to reach out to people. And I think that's so important, I think, with any movement is to be able to reach out to, to others and see how you can align, you know, your campaign, you know, with their fight, you know. And so with the work that I do, um, even um, you know, advocating for, um, you know, the adolescent health, um, what we're trying to do is actually come onto platforms like this, which we're, we're so happy to do, you know, and to see how we can join forces with, you know, other movements that are fighting to end violence, other movements that are fighting for, you know, um, sexual health and reproductive rights is to say that, you know, um, you know, we shouldn't look at, um, you know, these issues that are affecting like women or our children, you know, as isolated issues, because then that I don't think does any justice. All it does, it separates, um, you know, issues that our children or women in general are, are, are going through. And rather, we should probably just look at how it is that we can join forces and, 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 and un in a united front in order to see what it is that women, you know, uh, have to deal with commonly. You said that you didn't know you could ask for help. Yeah. What made you finally ask for help? Um, you know, in, in rehab, um, they talk about hitting rock bottoms. Um, and my rock bottom was my daughter being killed um, by a drunk driver. When my daughter was, um, was killed, I was um, in hospital um, after an attempted suicide that was brought on by a um, psychotic episode as a result of my cocaine use. Um, and had it not been for that, um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the situation would be different. And I still had my son to live for. At the time, I had my, um, my son, who's just five years um, younger than my daughter, to live for. But, you know, I guess I had um, been trying to find other ways for so long in my life to kind of, like, deal with the demons in my life because, you know, I always wanted to, you know, put this, this front that I was this person. And there was just so many pressures about being a Mandela. You're supposed to be the strong woman. You're supposed to be, you know. And um, so I guess for me, you know, speaking out was just, I guess... Um, 
um, not so much about my losses, but you know what people stand to gain from the realization that it does not make me immune to social ills that are faced by so many, and that you know I'm hoping that I can you know with my story affect some kind of change. Alva, yeah. just 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 listening to you, I just think it's it's incredibly brave to allow yourself to be, to, to it, it, it's brave and it's, it's so generous of you yeah. to show that vulnerability. Yeah. And just to say a big thank you, because I mean it does, it also occurs to me that there is this, there is a real expectation, isn't there? That if you're sort of constructed as a, le as a leader, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that any of us actually think of ourselves in those terms, we're people with our complicated lives, um, you're con and it's as if you can't ever show a flaw, an mm -hmm. imperfection, a mistake, a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And yet when that vulnerability is there, it's when you're at your strongest. Yes. So you're a really strong woman. Yeah. And honestly, isn't it just that honesty is fantastic, I think. And not to be afraid, not to be afraid of that vulnerability because it does actually strangely help us when we sort of assume it and live it to be the strong women that we all fundamentally are, I think. Yeah. I want to spend the last few minutes asking each of you what has been the most difficult moment in your movement, personally, and how you've overcome it. And I'll just start from, from you, Lena. What has been the most, from Le I'll just start left to right. What has been personally that rock bottom moment for you? Maybe that moment when you said, I can't do this, and how did you get over it? There was um, a day I received a call from a Cameroonian from the UK who told me I was adding the dark pain to the dark continent, Africa, by speaking about breast ironing and sharing negative stories about Africa like a journalist, not, very, not a very good thing. I felt so low, but I picked up myself and started again because I believe in the power of women speaking out for themselves because it's not me painting Africa dark. It's me cleaning our own mess. Mm -hmm. I think the solution to Africa's problem should not come from the West. It should come from, from our own selves. We have the capacity, we have the intelligence, we have the solutions. We should not allow anybody to name and solve our problems for us because we have the same capacities that people from all over the world have. If I stay quiet, a white woman is going to come to Cameroon and talk about breast iron and try to bring a solution. That's going to be an embarrassment to me. So I strongly, strongly hold that women have to, in all parts of the world, have to clean their own homes, using their own voices, using their own technology, and using their own connectivity. Thank you. Nolene. I'm, I feel the pain every day, and time is short. And one of the reasons why I've put down a lot of my other work to concentrate on bringing together economic, ecological, and climate justice work is because in the Pacific and any climate frontline peoples around the world um, are already facing loss and damage at a time when in the UNFCCC official processes, they're trying to remove the words loss and damage from the agreement. So for me, at the, the, the pain for me is about structures and systems that know how terrible neoliberal capitalism has been to all of us. We know this. Yes. Yes. And yet, <laughs> okay. so many of us are not willing to then take the next step and say, so what's the created alternatives? Mm -hmm. Because the movements of people and women all over the world, in the majority world, we know what we have to do. We have things like the binding um, treaty, the UN binding treaty on human rights and corporations that we have to put into place. We have to get off fossil fuels. In the next five years, what the Harvard Climate um, Center is saying is that if we don't do it, we ourselves as a species face extin extinction. When you start to speak the language of extinction, mm -hmm. your body moves in a way it didn't before. And I really hope that it leads to a, a, to a rise in all of us Thank doing you. this work. As, no matter where we are or what we're working on, climate and ecological justice has to be at the center of our Thank work. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, I'm sitting here thinking about that, Barker, since you asked. I, I've been at this a long time, so I've seen a lot of things come and go. Elections won and lost. You know, the Equal Rights Amendment was the first thing I worked on 40 years ago in, in, in Illinois, and we lost, except yeah. that we just ratified it 40 years later. Um, so you have to, you know, pick up, I, I have to say, not to end sort of on a downer, I am the most afraid right now that I have been in my entire adult yeah. life. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want to convey a sense of urgency today. This, you know, you don't often know that you're living in a historical change moment. We know we are yeah. in one now. Yes. And there are two pathways that this can go, and one is really dark. Yeah. And, and so this is the moment. This if you ask where's the lowest, I have to say, for coming out of the Obama administration, I'm still here, right, at the lowest moment because we are really at a crossroads. And we have got to all redouble our efforts, the whole, you know, put everything else aside. This is the moment of your life. You will look back when you have grandchildren, and they will ask you, where were you right now at this moment, 19 and 20, 2019, 2020, going into that, when the world changed yeah, where were in you? one way or the other. This is it. This is the moment. Thank you for driving that home. <laughs> Venina. I've got two minutes left, so I'm going to ask everybody to be brief. Voy a, Venina, yeah. Voy a decir rápido. Eh, en 2016, cuando volvíamos del Encuentro Nacional de Mujeres que se realizó en Rosario, que por primera vez eh, las grandes manifestaciones de mujeres comenzaron a ser reprimidas en la Argentina, eh, nos enteramos, llegando a Buenos Aires, de un asesinato brutal, eh, un femicidio brutal en la ciudad de Mar del Plata. Eh, El femicidio, una de las características que tiene es que es una pedagogía de la crueldad. Eh, ese, son, son mensajes para nosotras, para que no usemos nuestra libertad, para que no, eh, para que no tengamos eh, vidas libres, dignas, para que no elijamos cómo vivir y para, que no, y para eh, recortarnos la palabra no a lo que no elegimos. Entonces, eh, fue devastador, fue una noche eh, realmente eh, dolorosa y movilizante y lo que decidimos fue hacer en seis días organizamos el primer paro nacional de mujeres, National Strike, eh, en Argentina. Y fue eh, ese día, llovía, salimos todas con paraguas, fue un, fue un día muy movilizante y, y con muchísima gente en la calle a pesar de la lluvia. Thank you. Uh, Tirana. Um, I've had a lot of lows in this, in this work in over 25 years. Uh, I've, it's always been self-funded. I, you know, I, I went without a job for 18 months and decided not to do it. But in 2017, when Me Too went viral, um, in the very beginning, I was largely not a part of the conversation. And, and it was a moment, very clearly, when I said to some friends, I think I'm gonna, let, I'm gonna let these people have it. Mm -hmm. Nobody is gonna believe that this 44-year-old black woman from the Bronx created this work. And I was going to just let them, I said, you know, it's not about the, it's not about the name, it's about the work. And, and cause I kept hearing people saying the catchphrase, me too, and it was driving me crazy, mm -hmm. as if me too was just about these two words. And, and I heard, a, I was watching an interview on television with some folks, you know, more famous than I was, and I realized that, and this was, this was no, just not to disparage them in any way, but what I realized from listening to that interview was, it's not just about celebrity, but it's about vision. Yes. And I realized that I had vision for a way forward, and that that vision mattered. And whether people listened to it or not, I still had to hold tight to the fact that I had vision. It's me too, and, and our work is not just about inspiring and, and making people feel good. It's about a vision for a way forward to end sexual violence. And it's not the only vision, and I hope to inspire other people to come forward with their visions, but it's about this work. And whether I'm famous or not, have a platform or not, I realize I have to con continue on the vision, on the path that I've had for all of this time to bring this vision to the world. And so that's how it went from low Thank time. Thank you. I, I actually ran out of time, so I'm just gonna ask you 10 seconds each to quickly. Uh, Please, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is not in my control. Oh, yeah. I've been planning my what I was going to say. I'm saying <laughs> my personal low was when I put myself out in the trade union movement to run as president of my union, and I lost the election by two votes. Oh. With the prime minister in the room and all the press there and everything. But it was also the new beginning. 
and that's the morale, because we were the first ever three women leadership of that union, and we proved all our skeptics wrong. Fantastic. And now we have to continue. I want to continue also seeing all the sisters around me, creating the small rooms where they can try out. Can I voice or can I not voice in a safe space? Mm -hmm. okay, well, how do you want me to support you and push you forward? So that's how we're moving it. Zaleka. Yes. Um, I'm a mother of five, so I'd say like um, the lowest for me and the most painful was um, other than the fact that you know my daughter was killed um, by a drunk driver. It's the realization that um, on the day that my daughter passed away, 3,000 other children died. Um, on that day, because that's how many children we're losing uh, every day. And, you know, um, so much as, as much as, you know, sexual violence and that sort of things, these issues are affecting our young people, but these are epidemics that are, are man-made and, and are preventable. Um, so, and I think it's important to, to, to remember that in our efforts, um, you know, we need to all come together and ensure that, you know, we use the power of our children to mm -hmm. change, um, not just, you know, um, um, the world for, for them, but for future generations. Alba. I think um, for me it was uh, immediately after our victory was that realization that comes that one swallow does not a summer make and one victory never changes the world. So how was all of that energy and that power and that, that knowledge and expertise, how were we going to keep that momentum going? How were we going to share it with other people? And that actually, no, I couldn't stay in bed that morning, that we had to get up and <laughs> keep going because because the situation is so bad now, it's so threatened, and yet we know we're so powerful, that that is the very moment when we have to keep ourselves going and keep out there in unity, in solidarity, in hope, in belief that we can actually make a better world for everybody. And that is really, for me, what freedom is all about. Thank you. I just, I just want to say in the end, We've been talking about the power of movements. To me, there is a movement right here in this room. So feel it, celebrate it, and embrace it. Thank you very much to our panel. A big round of applause to these fantastic women. Feel free to jump to your feet. We can have a standing ovation for them. Please welcome to the stage Maria Bernarda Ordoños Moscoso, who will be introducing the winner of the Delivering for Girls and Women Award. One of the first feminist books that I read said women and men have never shared the world in a fair conditions. Although the situation of women has improved, we still have many barriers to the full exercise of our rights. Inequality is manifested in girls who can't study and they are forced to marry. In my country, Ecuador, each year more than 3,000 girls are sexually divorced and they are forced to be mothers. Like in other countries, exist women who can drive cars or be financially independent. Today, in Women Deliver Conference, is filled with hundreds of young leaders with the power to change the world. It's a privilege for me to present this recognition to Lovjane Adhaoult and all young advocates around the world who face barriers. 
Lujen Adhaul is a young woman who was sent to jail for fighting for the right of women of drive a car in her country. From Vancouver, we send all our support because her cause is our cause, and we will not rest until women in Saudi Arabia and women worldwide has the right to decide. We will come to a stage to friends to Lujen to accept this award on her behalf as they are working to bring awareness to her cause and that other women and young people whose voice are unjustly silenced. We are very excited to accept this award on behalf of Lujain Al Hatlul as Friends of Lujain, a collective of women based here in Vancouver who knew her from our time together at the University of British Columbia. Lujain sadly cannot be here with us herself today because since May 2018, she has been imprisoned and tortured in Saudi Arabia for her incredibly brave women's rights activism that has led to the end of the drive-in ban there. This award today is a testament to the impact that Lujane's activism has had around the world, and she joins thousands of young activists globally whose leadership is changing the world despite the repression they may face as a result. In the past year, Lujane has also been named one of Time 100's most influential people and has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize among numerous other international recognitions. We are honored and excited to celebrate with her and hope that one day soon, she is free herself to accept all of these deserving accolades herself. Thank you so much. We are honored to be here today, and we would just like to recognize that in the face of this grave injustice, the silence of the Canadian government is incredibly telling. We hope that you will join us in celebrating Lujane's achievements and in condemning the atrocities that are taking place against her. This concludes our plenary session. Ainsi s'achève cette séance plénière.